one sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. From home and friends, the evil spirits drove him among the tombs. He dwelt in misery. He cut himself as demon powers possessed him. Then Jesus came and set the captive free. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. <clears throat> So men today have found the Savior able. They could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and glory, for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Wow. Love that. And uh, Miss Janet, you can sign any time. Uh, I'm telling you right now, that's a blessing. And uh, certainly appreciate that tonight. And uh, if you wouldn't mind turning to Deuteronomy for me tonight. Series in the home, and I'm just going to use the pulpit tonight, brother. So uh, I don't have my pack with me, and that's all right. I'll not run around, okay? Not tonight. Amen. Certainly appreciate it. I love that song. Amen. And uh, I was trying to think, was it, uh, who was it? J. Vernon McGee or who? Lester, Lester Roloff. Uh, that, was, that was his song. And uh, man, love to hear that. And wonderful, wonderful words. So true tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number six. And we're continuing our series on the home tonight. And again, hope it will be a help to you. 
and an encouragement to you and you say uh, whether you whether you have a home of, of young children or not does not matter this is uh, for a home of just a, a couple that may not have children or as grandparents it does, however God has your home established uh, always teaching and preaching on the home will help you and encourage you in some way and strengthen your home but in Deuteronomy chapter 6 tonight and verses number 4 Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses number 4 if you're there say amen, amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. They, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Heavenly Father, tonight, again, I pray that you would encourage hearts through your word. I thank you for the testimony tonight of your missionary family. I thank you, Lord, for blessing them and, Lord, just uh, directing the river of their life, Lord, to Miami. Lord, they can continue the work and probably be greater than it's ever been. I pray that you continue to bless their household, bless every home represented here tonight. You know every heart, you know every need. And, Lord, I pray that tonight, by the time we leave church, people will be encouraged, be strengthened in you. And, Lord, if there's one in our service, I don't know the heart, but you do. If there's one in our service that's not saved, that tonight will be that night they come to Christ before they leave here. And, Lord, I pray you have your way in all things. We'll love you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen tonight. I just want us tonight for a few minutes to deal with the family altar. We talked a little bit last week about um, the role of the, of, the, of the head of the house. And uh, tonight in this series, really just looking at the family altar. And uh, it's often been said that a family with the family altar, it will alter the family. And uh, it's very important that you strive in some ways to have a representation of a family altar in your home. And again, whether you have children or not doesn't matter. It ought to be that some way your, you and your spouse have a time of, of prayer. You have a time that you, you have reading and different things. And uh, when the word of God is read, uh, prayer is offered in the family together. A lot of times things that are problems in your home will be dealt with. A lot of times it's the things we fight, and you know, we talk about this all the time, church. A lot of things we're dealing with today, most things we're dealing with today is not flesh, it's what? Spiritual. Right. So if it's spiritual outside of our church and it's spiritual inside of our church, where is it also spiritual at? In our homes. A lot of our, a lot of our battles are spiritual battles. A lot of our struggles between our, our spouses and us are spiritual struggles. With our children, they're spiritual struggles. That's why the devil does not want a home to ever represent or look like a replica, replicate of the church. He does not want it to be any kind of representation of the body of Christ. He wants it to be dysfunctional. He wants it to be disharmony. He wants it to always be a struggle between the mom and the dad and the, or the husband and the wife and the children because if he can keep the, the house in disarray, what can he also keep in disarray? The church. And what we say last week, so goes the home, so goes the church, so goes the nation, all these things, of course, you know those things very well. Uh, the, the old saying that's been said many times, the family that prays together does what? Knows that. Uh, but it, how true that is, a family that prays together uh, stays together. There's a, there's a tightness about it. There's a unity 
about that family. Now, pastors wonder why our church services are cold and void of the senses of God's presence among his people when we, uh, we meet together in the house of God. And usually it's because there's no presence of God in the homes that there's no presence of God in the churches. Yeah. I know it ain't, ain't going to be easy to say amen to a lot of this tonight, uh, but it is something that we need to really think about and focus on. A lot of times our problems with our churches reflect because of the problems in our houses, in our homes, and, and, the, and again, the dysfunction that is there. Uh, and so tonight, if you're writing these things down, first of all, tonight is the basis of the family altar. We come here to Deuteronomy 6 and, and verses number 4 through 6. He makes this statement. He says, I want you to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And we can say amen to that. He is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now we, we make that statement a lot of times. You hear that preached a lot of times. And a lot of people will roll on that particular verse. We're to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Yes, we're to do those things, but God has an order. He has a reason why things are set in a certain way and why God expects things. Again, God is a God of decency and order. He's not a God of confusion. He's not a God of, of, of turmoil. He's not a God of, of, of discontent. He's a God of, of things being in a certain balance, things being a certain way, things being what God expects. And friend, when our homes don't reflect those things, our churches will not reflect those things. And again, that's why we've got to have a time in our homes that have some type of a family altar about them. Now, and again, if you're writing these things down, the basis of a family altar is found here. A personal relationship with God is essential to having a family altar. And first of all, if you're not saved tonight, you must be born again. That's the bottom line. Uh, if you're a dad tonight or a husband tonight and you want to have a right home, you've got to be right with God first. That's just the first step. And you can't expect everybody else in your house to be right with God and you not be right with God. Amen. Amen. And uh, ladies, same thing with you. If you want your husband to be right with God, you need to be right with God too. Uh, a little bit less on that amen right there now. Uh, so here's the thing, y'all. There's got to, It's got to have a relationship with God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, he makes a statement here in this one pronoun that is mentioned. He says, the Lord our God is our Lord. He didn't say it's their God. It's some of those folks' God. It's our God. It's our Lord. And that is, again, what our homes need to be. It doesn't just need to be the God of dad. It doesn't just need to be the God of mom. It doesn't need to just be the God of the step parent. It needs to be the God of the house is the God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that needs to be the resemblance of what we pursue in our homes. The parents must have a personal relationship with Christ before they begin to teach the things of God to their children. It's got to be. There has to be a personal relationship with the Lord. Again, the old adage of do as I say, not as I do does not work when it comes to things of God. And that don't work in church either, by the way. Uh, I can tell you all day long how you should do, but if I don't do the things I'm asking you to do, I shouldn't open my mouth. I ought to keep them shut. Amen. That's all right. You can say amen to that. But the reality is in our homes when I tell my children, hey, I expect these things, I ought not expect something out of them that I don't expect for myself to be doing as well. I ought to be able to step up to the plate and be an example in this area. The Word of God must be in the heart of the parents before they can teach it to their children. This is not something, now hear what I'm getting ready to say. This is not something that you can just say you're going to do on a whim. To do this means you're going to sacrifice to do it. To do it means you're going to have to lay some things aside for your own self in order for this to be in your home. You're going to have to take something onto your own shoulders to carry this thing for it to be done. I'm telling you, when I preach these messages and I do this stuff, I, I'm not exempt of this. I'm right there sitting in the pew getting preached to myself. Okay? Because trust me, before I ever come out here to you with it, God's whooping me back there with it. Yes, he is. And by the way, if I don't get whooped by it, it ain't going to help you at all. That's just the reality. Now, a personal relationship with God is essential. Also, a love for God is essential to a family altar. He says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might is, to, is sure to produce a testimony 
in the home. If we love God with our heart, if we love God with our soul, if we love God with all our might, it is somehow going to produce a testimony in our home. I'm telling you, we need so much today, moms and dads, and yes, looking in a mirror at myself, we need so much today, parents, to have more of a heart for God than we do the things of the world. We need parents today that have more of a, thing, a heart for the things of God and God's things and God's house and God's time than we do for everybody else in the world if we can't have it for God first. We've got to have something for God in our hearts. It must be essential to the family altar. Jude commanded, he said in Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Wow. Well, preacher, we're not together any longer because we just fell out of love. Can I tell you something real quick? You got to work on that. Amen. And by the way, that ain't a one-way street. That's two-way street. That goes both directions. It's like picking up a phone and calling somebody, and you ain't talked to them in three months. And they say, well, I'm glad you finally decided to call me. Last time I checked first uh, uh, individual is you had a phone in your house too. And that door swings both ways. And my friend, in a relationship, in a marriage relationship, he said there in Jude, he said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Basically what he's saying, just keep yourselves in love with God. Right. Yeah. Keep the fires lit for God. Keep the furnace burning for God. Keep the embers on fire for God. Right. Sort of like a pastor one time went to go visit this little lady in her home. She hadn't been to church there in several weeks. She was mad. You know how that goes sometimes, right? She was mad. And he goes in, and uh, he really don't say anything, and she knows why he's there, and he knows why he's there. And uh, he sits down in the chair. She has a little fireplace going. And he goes over, and uh, she fixes him some coffee, and they just sit there. They really don't say much. But he goes over that little fireplace, and he, he takes a little ember off that fireplace with some tongs, and he sets it off to the side. And all of a sudden, after about 35, 40 minutes, that little ember begins to fade out until all of a sudden it's completely blacked out. He gets done drinking his coffee. He gets up out of the chair. He goes over to the fireplace, takes that little piece of uh, coal now with his own bare hands because it's so cold, puts it back over beside the fire, sits there for just a second, all of a sudden a little ember begins to glow again begins to get a little heat back to it and all of a sudden it ignites back in flames. He's getting ready to walk over to the door and that dear lady is tears rolling down her face. She said, Preacher, I appreciate the sermon. And what he was saying, what she was saying to him was this, thank you for showing me that I need to keep next to the fire or I'm going to get cold. Friend, what God is saying, what Jude is saying, we are to keep ourselves in love with God. I'm telling you tonight, you say, well, isn't God big enough to keep me in love with him? Well, I don't know. Is your spouse big enough to keep you in love with them? Him. Sometimes we've got to exhort effort into staying in this thing. We've got to do something to keep on fire for God. That's why when our young people come back from activities, that's why, listen, moms and dads, we ought to stoke the flames of fire in their life. When we, when we are on fire for God, when things are happening in our life, we need to stay around the fire of God in order to stay in love with God. Amen. This world's going to do enough to put your fire out. Amen. There's enough churches out here tonight that'll put your fire out. But thank God there's a God in heaven that my friend, he is burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. His fire never goes out. The only way I get cold on him is when I'm withdrawn from him. Amen. His fire is always lit. Amen. We got to stay near the fire. Stay in love with God. Make sure that God is in the heart of our throne, of our hearts, and also in the throne of our homes. We also see there has to be a possession of the word of God that's essential to the family altar. When the word of God is in the heart of the parent, Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Man. If you're tonight, you've been saved by the grace of God. You remember that day? Yeah. You remember what it was like that day? You remember how God, through the Holy Spirit of God, moved on you and convicted you and showed you what you were but showed you who he was? And man, you called on him and he saved you out of that muck and that mire. You remember that day? Yeah. 
You know why you remember that? Because it was something that I'm telling you right now. You may not remember the date. You may not remember the time. But you remember the moment. You remember when it happened. And you say, I remember it because something was stamped in my heart. And something changed in my life. And I can't get away from that because God did something in me I can't get away from. That's what happens, friend, when those things are in your heart. When it's in you. People don't have to make you go to church. You want to go to church. My kids, I, now Charlotte, bless her heart, she knows how to test me. Before going to bed last night, she came over to me and she said, Daddy, we go to church all day tomorrow. I said, is it Sunday? She said, yeah, but do we go to church all day? Yeah, baby, we go to church all day. But you know what? My kids, my boys, they know when Sunday's rolling around, you know what we're doing on Saturday? We're preparing for Sunday. We get up in the morning on Sunday morning. I ain't got to go in there and shake their... And listen, I thank God that I don't have to do this yet, and I hope I never have to. I don't have to go in there and shake their bed and say, bless us time to get up. We got to get to church. You know what? They're already dressed and ready before I am half the time. I say thank God for that. I'm, I thank the Lord. But here's the thing. It's a known fact we're going to be in church. We're going to church. There's no question. What are we going to do on Wednesday night? We're going to church. There's no question. Friend, I'm telling you that when it's in our hearts, it'll be in our homes. It'll be in our homes. The word of God in a person's heart will guide the motive, the action, and the desires of that person. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Boy, you hide something away. What that's speaking toward is a precious item. You don't want it stolen. You know, it's sort of like we have a safe, and that's really what the Word of God is alluding to there in Psalms. It's almost like a safe. You go in your homes, and, and, and if you have a safe in your home, most of the time you've got some prized things in that safe. You've got some, some documents that probably mean something so when you pass away, your children know where they are. Maybe you've got some nice, uh, uh, some nice uh, souvenirs in there. Maybe you've got some things passed down from, uh, from, from past generations. Uh, you've got some things in there. You do not want a thief to be able to come in and to break in and to steal it. You don't want a fire. It may burn the house down, but it ain't going to burn that up. What he's saying, these things have I hid in my heart. And what he's saying is that thing is like that safe in our heart. These words, Lord, have I hid in my heart. The devil can't steal it. Fire can't take it out. My friend, I'm telling you tonight, he's saying it's hid there and it cannot be removed because it's deep in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because you can mark it down, church, the devil's coming after you to steal it out of you. And he will. We've talked about that, about instilling our joys. We see here the word of God in a person's heart will guide them. When you look at your heart, you have to ask three things. Is there a personal relationship with God? Is there a personal love for the Lord Jesus Christ? And is there a personal possession of the word of God in our hearts? There may come a day, church, and you know what I preached about this morning. There may come a day where they come and they say, you can't have these anymore. And they come in our homes. Now, you say, preacher, that'll never happen. <laughs> they come in our homes, and they may not care if you got Playboys on the table. They don't care what you got on your computer screen. They start looking on the shelves. They start looking in some cubbies. They find that word of God got dust all over it. And they take it out of your home. And they take it out in your front yard. And they've gathered all the Bibles up in your neighborhood. And it may not be many or it may be a lot. And they take them out there in the middle of your street. And they put, a, put them out there and they throw them down on the ground. And they put a kerosene or lighter fluid all over them. And they ignite them. And you watch them burn. They may come. But thy word have I hid in my heart. You may take it, but you can't take it. Amen. You may take the physical book, but you can't take the spiritual one on the inside. I'm saying tonight these things must be hid away in our hearts. They must be something buried in us because when they do come for the physical, they can't take the spiritual. 
I'm saying tonight, that's why the Lord says, don't be afraid of those that can destroy the flesh. Be afraid of those that can destroy the spiritual. That's God Almighty. I'm saying to you tonight, church, these things must be laid deep. There's a basis of the family altar. Secondly, there's a demand for the family altar. He says there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 7, there's a demand, and thou shalt teach them. I want you to notice that. Thou shalt teach them. That is not a you may do this. You can if you feel like it. You will teach them. Because if you don't, I'm telling you, somebody else is teaching them stuff. They're teaching them. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine houses, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Preacher, you mean to tell me that all we can ever talk about in our homes is God? Well, it'd be a blessing if we did. But we understand tonight that ain't all we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a whole lot of other things. We're going to talk about character. We're going to talk about conduct. We're going to talk about how our children need to be. We're going to talk about how we need to be. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. But what God is saying in this is that somewhere along the day, somewhere along the avenue of life in the daytime that you have with your children or your stepchildren or your grandchildren or just the neighborhood children, it really doesn't matter. Friends, somewhere God ought to be mentioned. God ought to be discussed. There's a demand for it. The purpose of a family altar is to teach our children the things of God. Ezekiel 44, 23 said, The difference between the holy and the profane, and to discern between the unclean and the clean. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, God commands each generation to receive the report of the word of God from the previous generation and pass it on to the following generations. Get that? Look over in Psalm 78 with me real quick, please. Let's just look at this together. Psalm 78. Come hither. Psalm 78 and uh, in verses number 7. Now again, God's commanding us to, to pass down generation to generation... The report of the word of God. Psalm 78 verse 7. If you're there, say amen. amen. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. What are you speaking toward here is the fact that if we're not careful, we'll be the ones to break it off for the next generation. We'll be the ones to be the stubborn, bitter, uh, ones that want to have their pride get in the way of God, stop the blessings of God for the next generation. Think on that. What are we to do? We are to pass down from one generation to the next. That's why, again, I said this a few weeks ago, our churches cannot just be all young people. Our churches cannot just be all middle-aged. Our church needs to have senior saints too. The senior saints need the young. The young need the senior saints. They need the middle-aged. You've got to have it all. The one shows them where they came from. The other shows them where they're going to. I'm saying today, church, it's got to all work together. And listen, we are missing. We're, and I, not in this church. We've got some wonderful senior saints that love to help. Younger people love to help middle-aged. I thank God for that. I appreciate that very much. But there's a lot of churches tonight, hear what I'm getting ready to say, that don't have that older generation telling that younger generation about the things of God. They don't have it. They're missing it. Now, they got, the, they got all the young crowd, and buddy, they having themselves a good time. But they don't know what they're having a good time over. You're missing a key element. It's got to be passed down. And, and friend, if we don't do that, we're derelict in our duty to the things of God. God commands us to pass it down. If you want your children to walk with God, we have to teach them about God. You see, the pastor and the deacons, now let me say this real quick. The pastor and the deacons are to have home lives in which the children are taught to obey the principles of godly living. Yes, they are. Our children 
the deacon's children, of course, a lot of them are married. Of course, Brother Chris and his family and many others, Brother Jared and Miss Nikki. And Miss Nikki, I think, is in the nursery tonight. But we are to teach our children because God's got us set in roles that people see what we do and how we live. Now, whether we like it or not, we live in glass houses. Sure do. And our children, I'm going to say this tonight and hope this don't hurt nobody's feelings, but they ain't no different from everybody else's. They have to get saved just like everybody else does. They have to choose to live for God just like everybody else does. But when it comes to the pastor, when it comes to the deacons in the church, our families ought to have a higher standard. And hear what I'm getting ready to say? I know this ain't going to go over well in a lot of places. But the problem for a lot of problems in churches is because there's no moral conduct in the pulpits. There's no standard in the pulpit. And by golly, there's no standard in the church. I say, what'd you do? I say, by golly. You like that? <laughs> by golly. That's something out of a redneck book somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> by golly. The Christian man who would have his home to be what it ought to be must follow the examples. If the Christian man refuses to do so, the wife must do so for the sake of the children. Parents must not be slothful. This is Romans 12. Parents must not be slothful in business. They must be fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. As much as a man strives to want to have the biggest job, the greatest job if he is a father is to raise those children for God. It's the greatest job. I'm telling you, at the end of the day, men today are striving for the dollar. They're striving for the accolade. They're striving for the... And women too, by the way, not just men. Striving for everything this world can lay on them while their children lay as a train wreck and never see anything about God. The greatest job God's given us is parents, step-parents, grandparents. Again, parents to the children in the neighborhood. The greatest job that God has given us is to raise a generation for God. That's the greatest job. Thirdly, there's an influence of the family altar. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 8 and 9. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy head, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and on thy gates. A family altar can influence the works of your hands. Psalms 128 and 2 says, Eat the labor of thine hands. That means that we receive according to our deeds. Good acts will bring blessings and evil acts will bring judgment. Psalms 90 and verse 17, Establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Simply, it will make a difference in our conduct if we meet God each day with our family in worship. Again, I'm telling you, when, I, when these things are preached, I'm, I'm looking at myself in a mirror, church. I'm no different than anybody else. One of the hardest things I think to do is to have prayer with your family. One of the other hardest things to do is to witness to your family. You know why? Because it's your family. They know you. <laughs> yeah, they know you. And your children, they really know you. And you know what the devil does? Here's what the devil will do. God will set it in a man's heart. He'll say, that man will say, you know what, I really want to do this. I want to have a family altar in my home. I, I, want our, I want us to pray. I want us to have a moment of prayer. I want us to have the time to read the Bible. And here, as soon as you set that in your heart, as soon as it's in your, on your lips, before it ever hardly comes out, the devil is in your head. He's on your shoulders. And this is what he says. They just heard you yelling at mama yesterday. How are you going to pray today? Y'all looking at me like, take the halo off your head. That's what the devil does. How are you going to pray with your kids when you and her were having an argument yesterday? Well, my friend, I'm sorry to tell you, that's just marriage sometime. If marriage was all unicorns and rainbows and sunshine and roses, friend, everybody would be in on it and nobody would ever divorce. 
But that ain't the way it is, is it? But that's what the devil will do. He'll tell that man all of a sudden, you can't do that. You and her ain't. Y'all don't get along all the time. Well, you know what? If we start praying like we should, maybe we'll get along better. Oh, ho, ho. It's amazing how, how the devil wants to back you up in a corner, friend. We've got to have a family altar. A family altar can influence the thoughts, not, not only the works of your hands, but the thoughts of your mind. Verse 8 says, It shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. That means more than just wearing a piece of jewelry as decoration. It means the Bible will govern what you look at and what you see. The eyes are the windows of the soul. What you see will determine what you think. The influence of meeting God daily at a family altar will keep you looking at what is right and rejecting what is wrong. Proverbs 4 and 25, Let thine eyes look right on. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Fourth, there's the protection of a family altar. Verse number 10, It shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto the fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. Now he goes through this thing here, and he's warning them. You're going to go into places, you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to eat food that you didn't plant. You're going to enjoy blessings that somebody else did the labor for you to have. When that time comes, when that generation shows up and they're just enjoying the blessings, they've not had to do nothing, they've not had to cross a Red Sea, they've not had to go over Jordan, they've not had to eat manna for 40 years in a wilderness, they've not had to fight Jericho and lose at AI. I'm saying they've not had to do those things when they're enjoying the blessings that somebody else has labored over, it's a dangerous time that they may forget. Hear what I'm getting ready to say? Where you think our nation is. We've enjoyed the spoils of past prayers. Men that, I, and I, I, think, I don't know when I said this the other day, however it was, men that would spend time in the field plowing, and then he would, at, at midday, they'd break off. The, they'd go off into the woods and they'd beg God and pray for God to send a revival to bless their home, do different things in their community. They'd go back behind the plow. Women that would sit in their kitchen all day cooking food, you know what? They wouldn't just be in there, uh, just in their own, they'd be in there praying, talking to God and singing songs to the Lord. You know why we're blessed? Because there was grandmas and great grandmas that decades ago got with God that we have the blessings we have tonight. And I'm talking about spent time begging God. And here was the thing, not just begging God, Lord, help me today. Lord, help my husband today. Help my children. But Lord, my children that's coming, my grandchildren that's coming, their children and their children, God bless that generation. They were praying for us. And we're blessed today because of it. But all, oh, what are we leaving for the next? see today there's the protection of the altar a family altar will keep you from forgetting God if we meet God daily we are reminded that he is our God he said in Psalm 46 he's a refuge and strength a very present help in a time of trouble the family altar reminds us that God is sufficient to take care of all our needs he said there in Deuteronomy in chapter number 8 and verse number 18 he makes this statement he says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. A family altar will promote a reverent spirit toward God. He said there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. And here's a key little party put in there and serve him not enough just to fear him he wants us to serve him when one fears the Lord he will serve him sincerely and in truth and put away those things that displease God and harm man 
Joshua 24 verse 14 said, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. A family altar will motivate you to serve the Lord. Fear the Lord thy God, walk in all his ways, love him, serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And then lastly, many honest Christian people resolve to have a family worship time. They begin it but then they soon drop it. There's four suggestions to help you maintain your family altar, and here they are. Have a set time and place where you meet God with your family. That may differ for everybody, and I'm sure it will. Two, magnify the Bible by reading it together. Three, give time to pray. And then four, Deal beforehand with potential problems and interruptions to have family altar. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you. The devil's going to tell you right out the gate you can't do it. There's no way. You can't do this. Your children ain't going to listen. That phone's going to ring. Something's going to happen. Sure. The devil's going to do everything he can to interfere and interrupt it. But if we'll determine, and I say we, if we will determine to have a family altar like we're supposed to, we'll see God not only work in our homes, we'll see God work in our church. And then we'll see God work in our church, we'll see God work in our local areas, our nation, and where we live. We've got to get back to the fundamentals, the basics of following God in our homes. We can follow men... We can come to church in our nice suits. We can sing Amazing Grace on Sundays. But if our children think we just live for the devil the rest of the week, it doesn't matter. Mom's the same thing. Step-parents, the same thing. Grandparents, the same thing. We've got to have a time separated for God with our family that they see the difference. The devil's going to give them every opportunity to go another way. We ought to do everything we can to show them Christ before the decisions really start getting made in their life. Let's stand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. So they come tonight with an invitation song. Tonight, maybe you just want to come tonight and just ask God to give you wisdom and direction. Maybe you want God to help you tonight to take that step that you need to take. Again, whether it's a mom or a dad or a step-parent or a grandparent, 